college. I know that I'm cared for in this school because on the very first week I came here, everyone was extremely nice to me. I think it's important for our school to teach each children values because that will help them when they grow up, uphold those values and be their best self. My favourite thing about my school is that the sense of community that is in the school. I feel like everyone is included in everything. I like biology because I like learning how the body works and I like leaving Cert PE because I like learning the science behind the sports. After school I'd like to go to college. I'd like to study biomedical engineering in Cork. I chose to do a PLC course because I love doing the practical work. I've always wanted to build something and have my name written down on it. Currently I'm studying Advanced Game Development, which is a course about designing and programming games. Originally I started off with animation, traditional drawing, but uh, after discovering 3D modelling and animation could be combined, uh, I, I kind of drifted off towards the games design. Shortly after that then, I will be applying for the, the degree course here as well to continue my education. My Elflet and my two uncles are painters, so it's kind of in me blood after working summers with my um, Elflet. I decided to take on an apprenticeship in paint and decorating. People kind of underestimate sometimes the power a coat of paint has. Definitely ignited a bit of a fire in me or something to keep keep going, keep learning and progressing and trying to get the best apprenticeship I can. Some of my earliest and fondest memories are of standing in the kitchen with my sister and mum passing us on her skills and my sister and I so small we had tea towels for aprons. My ETB totally changed my view of adult education. They gave us all the skills and knowledge to make that jump from home baker to professional baker. If you have any question in your mind that you want to go and upskill or change your career or follow the path that you think you should be on, the ETB is most definitely the way to go. Well, my ETB to me is where I've developed a new love for certain aspects of the job. Where I found my purpose. Is where I get the education I need for life. My ETB is where all my friends are. The Eve Canary Green Ushla, August for Gate Fox Arrive, uh, Gadi on seminar, August on webinar, Shaw and Yov. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this special webinar today uh, with regards to looking at the implications of Chat GPT in schools and colleges. Um, I would like to thank General Secretary of ETBI, Mr. Paddy Lavelle, Director of Schools, Mr. Paul Fields, and the ETBI Communications Manager, Ms. Gwen Moore, for all their support and promotion of this webinar today across the ETB network. And what strikes me most about what we're going to talk about today is the fact that ChatGPT has just emerged as such a major talking point all over the globe, and everyone is, so, is growing increasingly interested in its evolution. Uh, it's so recent that even spell checkers like Microsoft Word and Google Docs have not even added it to as a term in their uh, dictionaries yet, possibly because of the fact that the Oxford Dictionary hasn't caught up with the, the terminology, but I'm sure if we put that into ChatGPT, uh, it would give us an answer as to why it's the case. And uh, I was just interested to see what kind of suggestions it would give me for replacement words for ChatGPT uh, in Microsoft Word, and some of the suggestions were chatty, chatterbox, and chatboxes. Uh, so all of them in some way relating to some sort of chat. Um, so why is this such a, a topical uh, issue and why are we focusing on its implications for education? Well, to help us with that today, we're delighted to be joined by, with a panelist uh, of uh, a great lineup of, of speakers, uh, Professor Stephen Kinsella, Ms. Vivian Hogan, and Mr. JJ Collins. Uh, Stephen is Professor of Economics at the University of Limerick, uh, Head of the Department of Economics and Research Associate at the Rhodes Centre for International Finance at Brown University. He, is also, he also directs or co-directs the Immersive Software Engineering Programme. Uh, in his spare time, uh, he is uh, Chief Economics Writer for the Currency News and was for four years a columnist with the Sunday Business Post. And uh, he also has written articles for The Guardian, The New York Times and The Irish Independent. Vivian is Principal of Thomond Community College, uh, Limerick and Clare Education Training Board Community College here in Limerick. 
And Vivian is very passionate about innovation and learning and teaching, and is an avid user of technology and the potential of new technologies in education. And uh, you'll also be interested to know that uh, Vivian is already using ChatGPT to uh, enrich her work uh, life balance. So we'll hear more about that later on. JJ is lecturer in software uh, design and architecture and deep learning in department of CSIS, University of Limerick uh, and immersive software engineering. He is head of residencies uh, and computer science course director. His research focuses on automated panelization of code using machine learning. And his previous experience uh, range spans uh, work and uh, time in computer vision, robotic map building uh, and workflow patterns. Uh, he's very committed to better quality diversity in education uh, in computer science, software engineering, and uh, he is very much uh, regarded and in, in, in very high regards by his students who attend his lectures, or so I'm told. Um, we are very happy that so many people from all over uh, Ireland are with us today, and uh, we're just going to jump straight in uh, to speaking with uh, Stephen, who has returned from the States uh, after visiting quite a few technology companies over there. So Stephen, if I can go to you, um, why is it important for schools and educators in general, uh, our directors and our chief executives to be familiar with what GPT uh, is all about? Well, thanks, uh, Donegan. and thanks to you and your colleagues for organizing this uh, important event. Um, as you said, this is, um, this is e equivalent in my mind to the introduction of something like Google. Okay, is that important? It's going to be something that people uh, uh, of our age have to learn to cope with and people who are 14, 15, 16, it simply for them will be. It's, so that's that's another uh, an, a very important point. Um, uh, as you said, I've just returned from a, 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 a 12 day five city tour in the US visiting companies all over uh, that, uh, that amazing country. Um, and uh, while I don't recommend the trip for the body, it was amazing in terms of opening up uh, your eyes to the progress that's happening, particularly in um, in AI. So one of the things I wanted to show everyone um, uh, is 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 this? Um, I don't know if, if if you guys can see this yet, but uh, I want to show you um, this chart. Um, what you should be looking at, if you can see it, is a corporate investment in artificial intelligence. So this is this is a chart um, that I made for my currency article, uh, looking particularly at. Uh, the influence of corporate investment in AI. And you can see that in 2013, it was about 6 billion, which is a lot, obviously, but but um, uh, nothing like what we're seeing today. It's $160, $170 billion, and it's only going up. So this is going to be very much um, the wave of the future. It is, it is something where uh, we are seeing active um, investment and the, the the curve, if you like, in an exponential, it's, we're, we're at the curve of that exponential. The other thing that to really look at in terms of the economics of this is this is very much something that is, you know, it, it, that began life as a public institution. So the blue line, the blue bars, there are big research labs in AI. Um, and you can see that, you know, over time, that's sort of become a private thing. So these are, it's very much um, uh, privately driven research enterprise and ChatGPT and, and OpenAI, which is the company that produces ChatGPT, that is in fact a, a, a private company. Um, the other thing to, to think about when you think about AI is as we talk about it, we are, we're going to be talking about AI in the, in the same way we talk about Google, which is that it becomes simply a tool that augments uh, some jobs, makes other jobs possible, and removes other jobs. And so it's it's thinking about this in this way that um, has uh, both JJ and myself working uh, so hard on the immersive software engineering program at UL. So, you know, this this course um, is, is all about doing new things uh, with technology and some of the best uh, firms in the world like Stripe and Amazon and many others. Um, and so when we're looking at this, we're actively teaching uh, 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 students um, this stuff. So they're actually in a situation where they can, if you like, uh, make the best use of AI, but also make their own AI. And so I think uh, it's probably important now that I, I stop and I pass over to JJ. Um, so, you know, the, the basic uh, message that you can take from me is A, it's very big, B, it's getting bigger, and C, everyone is going to have to be aware of this as, um, as uh, uh, time passes. 
Um, so yeah, I'll stop there and uh, I'll I'll pass uh, over to you. Thanks to... very much, Stephen. And you might just uh, stop sharing there, and JJ can take over and get his slides up. But uh, I suppose just to mention as well that we're going to have a, a, a discussion around uh, all of these various different uh, matters towards the end of this webinar. And uh, we'd very much appreciate any questions that people might have and some other information, uh, interesting points of, of of information that people would like to put into the chat. Uh, bar there are in the questions bar. So over to you, JJ, and thanks, Stephen. Okay, thank you very much for that, Dunca. i just run through a bit of background in ChatGPT version four. So it stands for Chat Generative. This is a particular paradigm or algorithm in machine learning, pre-trained and transformer, another algorithm which has been very significant. The first uh, academic paper on transformer technology was uh, written in 2017. So the cycle time between the publication of a concept and its adoption into products and release into the wild, as we say, is, is significantly reduced. Uh, the, there we have the link that you can try. You need to register. There's GDPR concerns. Then that one should be cognizant of when you're inputting queries into uh, ChatGPT. Fundamentally, it's a chatbot. The first chatbot was called Eliza. It dates back to 1964 or 1966 at MIT, uh, Weizenbaum. So there's 50 years of intervening development in the uh, underlying theoretical frameworks and the technology. Fundamentally, it's a language model. Any mathematicians on the call, previously we would have hidden or used hidden markup models, which were incredibly challenging, uh, but the transformer technology has taken a lot of the heavy lifting out of that. Using deep learning and artificial neural networks, neural networks are, it's effectively software that simulates the behavior of neurons in the neural in mammalian brains. And nowadays we have software that's able to simulate networks with up to uh, tens of millions of uh, billions of neurons. So as Stephen said, ChatGPT developed by OpenAI in 2018. OpenAI, just from a historical concept, it's a private um, organization, but uh, they have released a lot of tools to the public for research in the field of AI. Version four was released in March 23. Let's work through some examples. So this morning I asked that, what are you? And it says I'm ChatGPT, a language model created by OpenAI. I'm designed to understand natural language and generate responses to questions or prompts given to me. And the last sentence there, my purpose is to assist and provide helpful answers to users who will interact with me. The next, um, thinking back to my days as a second level student and Keats, I think, and the Grecian urn particularly resonated with me, not for reasons you might think, but I've asked it here, write a sonnet in the style of William Shakespeare about a vase. The first, um, for, we looked at first verse, oh, vase of beauty, fair and full of grace, thou art a work of art and dot inspire, etc. I don't know about you, and I have to confess I'm not a trained eye in the analysis of uh, poetry, but that doesn't do it for me. It does get better in the third verse. Indeed, the potter's art and nature meet to bring forth beauty from the humble clay, and through thee we can touch the pure and sweet and feel the joy of life in every way. Now, then again, if, um, just for you to consider, if we ask a student to write a verse and they came back with something like this, well, either you've got uh, a poet in your midst, or you've got somebody who's uh, quite adept at using ChatGPT. Next. So ChatGPT, not only can it write poetry, but it can also write essays. So here I've asked it, I write a 1000 word romance style essay about trees. Just the first paragraph there in the heart of the forest of a magnificent tree, it's towering height reaching up towards the sky. It was an ancient oak weathered by time and season by the seasons etc. So from an aesthetic perspective, I think this is getting there. It resonates with me, etc. But it does rely on a lot of the um, old and tried and tested approaches, i.e. that reference to an ancient oak there. That generates, um, or that raises a, a signal in my view. But here we have the beginning of an essay. Next, let's change topic. Let's assume we have a triangle ABC where A, B is the greater side and A, C is the smaller side. We need to prove uh, or sorry, go back. It was the, uh, the question was to ask to prove that, uh, a theorem from the mathematics leaving certificate. And there we can see it is able to do it. So that's from a maths perspective. 
Next, I changed topic and went on to industrial policy back in the 1960s. And I think the question was uh, related to uh, generate a multiple uh, an MCQ, multiple choice questions, five of them relating to that. So if we look at the last question, uh, what is the name of the report published in 1958 that laid the foundation for Irish industrial policy in the 1960s? And it gives four answers to the uh, first program for economic expansion, B, the economic report to government, uh, D, industrial policy review, and or, sorry, that's C and D, La Masse report. So uh, the answer being the La Masse report. But all of these five questions, I think you would agree, are very suitable questions that one would expect or one might see on an, as an assessment instrument on this particular topic. Next, I asked ChatGPT to design a syllabus for a topic on neural networks at leaving certificate level. And I came up with a number of suggestions. Uh, this being one, if I just briefly look, I, I, I gave it no hint about how it should structure the answer. So it comes back with the course title, the course overview in a few sentences, then the aims and then the course content. And for example, I lecture machine learning, neural computing with deep reinforcement learning, et cetera. And in my opinion, the course content is highly applicable, goes on introduction, mathematical foundations, how to build them, how to code them, how to train them, advanced topics, et cetera, all highly relevant. Again, going touching back to one of my favorite topics, uh, coding in the context of the computer science. So I asked that to, for an implementation of a bubble sort applied to an array of, of integers of numbers. So a bubble sort is one particular, man, there are many different sort algorithms. Why might we need many sort algorithms when they have different performance characteristics dependent on the type of data and volume of data that has been sorted? Here's an answer in Python, which I asked for. Not only that, but it goes on then after the code there shown in, in the screen, it goes on to give a brief code walkthrough, which is what we would expect from students if um, conducting an interview to determine whether or not they understand what they've submitted. And by the way, it's correct. Next, I asked it to write an essay about transition year. So this didn't ring true with me. I just looked at first sentence. As a transition year a student, breaks throughout the days can be a welcome relief from the routine and structure of classes. So my understanding of transition year based on my children who are just are currently or have recently passed through it is that it, it's, it, it doesn't have routine like we might have in fifth and sixth, sixth years, that type of uh, cadence. Um, it's every day is different, new opportunities for learning and to engage with the community and concepts. So the point about this is chat GPT, it is trained on content and the internet. And as we all know, some of that content is false, it's malicious, it's biased, et cetera. So chat GPT will give back um, erroneous answers. One of the recent developments in chat GPT version four, again released um, in March, is they have applied filters on top of the queries to try and eliminate those queries that would generate content that would be unpalatable. For example, anything to do with uh, racism or et cetera, or intolerant views. So that's some of the recent work. What else can ChatGPT do? A few suggestions here. Design, attempt to solve maths and science problem, role play scenarios, identify potential misconceptions students might have about the content. The students submit content and get ChatGPT to critique it. Remix student work or actually improve student work. Provide low quality and high quality writing examples, um, effectively providing a grading rubric. Give students feedback on their writing, provide tips on how to personalize, differentiate learning, et cetera. There are significant limitations with ChatGPT. So number one, it's not sentient. This is not the beginning of consciousness as we might think we understand it. Number two, it doesn't understand any of the uh, text that it returns in its response. It has no understanding, does not have a handle on semantics. Third, because it's trained on data from the internet, this, as I've said previously, is particularly problematic for machine learning paradigm that's using this data. Um, because it's biased, it's inaccurate, it's erroneous, and it's, uh, it's false in, in some cases. Last, biased. Again, if you think about the, a lot of people who are generating content on the internet, 
not a lot, sorry, but some people, um, particularly social uh, media, we've heard often about the level of toxicity there. So just to be aware of that. I asked ChatGTP to critique itself, a uh, second paragraph. However, like any AI model, ChatGPT has also certain limitations. One is that it may sometimes generate responses that are irrelevant or incorrect, particularly if the input it receives is unclear and ambiguous. The next paragraph, another limitation is that it may not have, well, it does not have the ability to reason or understand the concepts in the, in the way that humans do. So that's something, can't dice and slice concepts, parse them, and then combine them to produce new outputs. So effectively, ChatGPT, is from a mathematical perspective, a statistical inference. It's very advanced statistical inference, but at a very basic level, let's say, for example, if the word architecture appears, what is likely, what are the likely words that typically will follow that? And it uses that to build up a sentence. So we've seen almost on a daily basis, a plethora of, of articles in mainstream media. Here's one from The Guardian, I think this was, in January, Australian universities were to return to pen and paper exams after students caught using AI to write essays. I had an experience myself, uh, December final exams, exa uh, 9 to 11.30 in an exam hall uh, during very bad weather. And a few students asked me if it would be permissible for them to take an online exam. It'd be a different exam, but to do it online. And I, I agreed thinking, you know, being the good Samaritan, but others in the class felt aggrieved. So they brought my attention to ChatGPT. I ran all the online questions through ChatGPT and it produced stand question, or responses that would have, if graded, would have been a B1 or A2. Recently, we've seen, for example, implications for GDPR. So there we have an article from the examiner. The Italian Data Protection Authority is now investigating whether ChatGPT has complied with European GDPR rules. And this is really important in the context of its deployment in a classroom or at home situation. Help is, well, there are claims that helper is on the way. So Turnitin that we use for plagiarism detection here at the University of Limerick, and it's used widely in academia. They're developing a tool that will help to deter, or they claim will help to identify the likelihood of ChatGPT being used in the uh, provisioning of that submission. Next, we have AI Text Classifier, and this again is from OpenAI, the organization that released and uh, developed and released ChatGPT. So their um, OpenAI Detection 2 uh, requires some limitations on it, requires a minimum of 1,000 characters, so it can detect, for example, if it's um, essays or poetry, that type of submission. I did try this, I got uh, ChatGPT to generate an essay, I took the first 1,000 characters and put it into the uh, our open AI detection tool and asked, well, who's the author of this and wasn't able to state. Two other points and then I'll be ready to hand over. So the first is that this ChatGPT is just the beginning of a revolution that is going to transform society. This revolution is embedded in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So here we have another example from OpenAI, and this is with a robotic arm. It has fine finger, or it has fingers so fine, uh, fine uh, motor control required in this, and it's solving the Rubik's cube. And it's doing it's able, not shown in the picture the fact that we have cameras as well. So being able to hold a cube in your hand, being able to view it, we think these are intuitive. It's something we don't have to think about uh, as children, as babies. We learn how to do this relatively quickly. Um, so therefore it should be easy. And what is difficult is tasks such as how to solve a theorem, etc. But uh, recent thinking in the field of artificial intelligence is that actually it's the other way around. Being able to uh, survive an environment, mobility, vision, perception, being able to interact and be able to communicate, which requires a language model. These are the really challenging tasks. Would you master these? then you can move on to uh, theorem proving, et cetera. So for me, ChatGPT, what we're looking at here, these are significant game changers. I didn't believe I would see them in my lifetime until recently. Another from OpenAI, DALI2, it's a new system that can create realistic images and art from a description in natural language here. I asked it to, for an impressionist painting of Limerick City, 
Here are some examples that I find these aesthetically quite pleasing, quite soothing, and they capture scenes in Limerick that are known to anybody who has either hailed from the city or has visited the city. So you start combining these avatars, voice uh, synthesis, and then all of a sudden I'm beginning to wonder about the requirement for me as a lecturer going forward. Perhaps I'm not um, they're not required 100% of the time, I think. So I think that human element is important in a teaching and learning context, but not to the degree that it currently is. So just a summary, is this another cycle hype you might all be wondering because you think back with the dot com in the late 1990s, 2000s, cryptocurrency going on. And for those of you who've done some research into the subject, um, we have had previous AI winters, a lot of hype and the reality never uh, manifested itself and, and it died off. I think, as Stephen said at the outset, there are a number of reasons why this, in my opinion, is not a cycle hype. Uh, number one, the availability of high quality trading data sets, which are very expensive to create, but these are publicly available, compiled by various organizations and released over the last 10 years. Number two is the availability of uh, computing hardware that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. For example, a graphics card can do a lot of number crunching. Every PC or laptop has a graphics card. So they've developed frameworks or software frameworks to use graphic cards for trading the AI systems. And the third, as Stephen pointed out, is the amount of investment by the ICT players in AI, particularly developing AI frameworks in vision, et cetera. You combine all of these together and we have a significant uh, paradigm shift in the ICT landscape. The second point there, all the big ICT players investing billions in house and deep learning frameworks applied to machine computer vision. Computer vision has traditionally been the benchmark and being able to infer or identify objects and infer context from a uh, picture is very challenging from an AI perspective. Chat GPT-4 allows you to upload a picture and have the system query it, etc. For control for speech language models, recently you might have heard of AlphaGo, Go being a very challenging game, AlphaFold, and uh, this is protein visualization and unfolding in pharmaceutical discovery. And more recently, AlphaCode, and all these are from Google, and these will have significant impact upon society. And as well, cyber physical, now we've robotics platforms using AI that um, have incredible adaptability, versatility, and applicability. One area would be in assisted health, etc. So we're just at the beginning of a change in society. Where we're going, I have to confess for the first time, I have no idea. Going back to uh, briefly, uh, Stephen talked about immersive software engineering, a new offering here at the University of Limerick. And one of the key points about that, by the way, just in passing is the five residencies and that it's accelerated intensive and students graduate with a master's after four years, which is highly unusual in Irish context. We have to go back here in immersive software engineering and revisit our whole approach to assessments within that particular program given um, chat GPT. Uh, just a few points and then I'm going to hand back to my colleague Stephen. So if we look at uh, uh, universities that have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this and have a, uh, formulated a set of questions and we're doing the same here at the University of Limerick, but here I've just taken the Waterloo example uh, questions, what is chat GPT, generative AI, what are limitations, ethical considerations, privacy and security considerations, using uh, chat GPT or other AI tools considered cheating, is there a syllabus statement on student use of AI tools, is there a detection tool, how can I reduce the risk of students cheating with AI, but this again comes back into how we incorporate it into the curriculum, how we get students to acknowledge their use of it, and then build value on top of that. How can AI tools be used effectively? Can I require students to use ChatGPT for an assessment to bootstrap them? How should students cite the AI tool, et cetera? So just gonna conclude before handing back to my colleague, Stephen, who will give an overview of some of the thinking in the Kinney Business School here at the University of Limerick. My view in ChatGPT, the beginning of a disruptor wave. Think of, uh, think of ChatGPT as a private tutor for every student. 
but be aware that that is a tutor who's consumed all content on the internet. That tutor has assumed all that content to be true. So they're, um, they will re respond or they will return or instruct students uh, in generating content that is biased, sometimes inaccurate, etc. So from a pedagogical perspective, this is my philosophy about ChatGBT, that it's out of the box, um, too late to put it back in, so to embrace it, to rethink how our approach to education that is centered around a whole plethora of AI tools, redesign our syllabus, our assessment instruments, et cetera, and use this as an opportunity to um, introduce innovation in our everyday uh, teaching and learning context so that we enhance the student experience. Okay, with that, I'll hand back to my colleagues, uh, Stephen, just to give a few words about the Kimmy Business School experience with ChatGPT. Thanks, JJ. I, I guess the, the way that I think about uh, ChatGPT is the same way I think about um, a search engine called Who Is. So the first ever search engine uh, for the internet was in 1982, and it was called Who Is. Um, nobody remembers it now because we have the major search engines of Google and Bing and so forth. Um, the, it, we're exactly in that place now. So ChatGPT, in 20 years time, nobody will remember ChatGPT. It won't be something that is on the tip of, tips of everybody's um, lips uh, and at the tips of everybody's tongues. The reality of the situation is that we are in an environment where things will evolve extremely rapidly. And I think this is probably something that everyone here as an educator simply needs to be aware of and, and uh, I, as JJ says, embrace. No one here would think today about stopping their students from Googling, for example, uh, when, when preparing for an interview or when preparing for an assignment. Um, it will be the same. Uh, nobody will think about that in the future. So uh, three things that we're doing in the Kemi Business School. The first is that we we are we are embracing uh, uh, ChatGPT um, in the sense that we are saying to our students, we expect that you will use this. We we are not banning your use of this. We we are going to alter our assessments and our pedagogical strategies in order to ensure that you have absolutely the best outcomes uh, with using this stuff. I think another key point. Uh, uh, that JJ has repeatedly made is that this is not actually trustworthy. And this is a very, very important point. You can ask ChatGPT, what is two plus two? You will get the correct answer. You can ask Ch ChatGPT, who was Martin Luther King? And he, he will give you the Wikipedia entry um, from, or, or, or a mishmash of all of the things ever written about Martin Luther King. If you ask ChatGPT, what is the optimal tax rate for the Irish economy in 2023? It will not be able to give you a good answer, but it will try to give you a good answer. And it's very likely that answer will be wrong. If you ask ChatGPT for a list of references about uh, you know, um, the uh, best things about the Irish economy, best things written about the Irish economy in the last 10 years, it will generate a list of references, but almost all of these references will be fake. Um, and so it's very important uh, to inculcate in every student the uh, the necessary skepticism with respect to this tool. You don't believe everything you read on Wikipedia. You don't believe everything you see on Google. You shouldn't believe everything that comes into uh, the chat GPT window. That said, it is going to be incredible as a tutor. I, I have produced um, basic courses in economics using chat GPT as an experiment. It gets it mostly right. It doesn't do well at intermediate or advanced economics, um, but it'll get there. Like I said, um, we're there in in a couple of um, in a couple of years uh, time. So what I might do now, um, because we have about uh, uh, twenty five minutes left, um, is I might go to some of the uh, questions um, that are uh, uh, out there. If that's all right with you, Donica. Absolutely, Stephen. Uh, go for it there. There's quite a few questions that have uh, started to come in there on the Q and A. Yeah, and great. Thanks everybody for their contributions, we really Indeed. appreciate it. Like, uh, again, this is a conversation around you know how we as a an education body are are meeting the uh, the challenges and and the and uh, you know taking advantage of the potential of ChatGPT as well. So by all means, we don't have the answers to everything here, and it's the very enriching and engaging uh, conversation and contributions of everybody on the call here today that's certainly helping to uh, generate the conversation around what we should be thinking on. So thanks, Stephen. If you'd like to go through some of those, it'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, well, uh, so one anonymous person asks, what is ChatGPT biased towards? And um, the, the answer is because it's trained on a, a database of text on the internet. If, for example, every piece of text was racist, 
um, then ChatGPT would be racist. Um, it is capable of generating different arguments, um, but fundamentally, that's its that's its um, that's its uh, um, that's its training data, as JJ um, said. Um, there's loads of questions coming in, so if everybody could click that, that'd be great. Um, so uh, John Ross asks, maybe one for you, JJ. Can ChatGPT show some some kind of electronic watermark for assessors? I'm not that I'm aware of, but even with electronic watermarks, I know students here would be able to remove that and the underlying metadata that I would look for to see was it um, was the watermark applied originally. So, um, mm. uh, yeah. Patrick uh, asked, is ChatGPT good for generating content on a topic that could be used to develop content for specific subjects? Of course, it, re re it would be reviewed. Is it good for definitions? The answer that I've uh, come across in my use of ChatGPT, and I've used it relatively extensively over the last couple of weeks, is yes, actually. It is pretty good at generating topics, content on topics, but you want to really know what you're looking at before you can check that it does indeed work. Would you agree, JJ? Yeah, I would agree with that. If you're a, an expert in the subject matter and you're caught for time, I would get ChatGPT to generate lectures or a set of lectures, etc. I saw on one of the slides earlier that we had a, a, an outline syllabus for a leading cert, certificate topic in neural networks, which I don't think is part of the current curriculum. And it was a, re, a very reasonable um, so, or suggestion. Great. Uh, one for you, Vivian. Uh, John uh, asks, AI is going to transform assessment. I think we need to be assessing the process, not the artifact. I think the swing to a PBL approach over a rote learning approach is where a lot of smart people are placing their bets in a K-12 environment. Would you agree? Yeah, I was actually looking at John and he's another comment later on there as well. It is, I mean, we are assessing, and that's what the education system, I suppose, in Ireland, particularly the CBA level and junior cycle is going, is about assessing the process. You know, in our school, I suppose we brought it in there and had very open, transparent conversations with the students that it's a tool and use it as a tool. And it's a very good tool, ChatGPT. You know, it doesn't replace your own, I suppose, expertise in it or the expertise of the teachers, but to use it as a tool. And we're seeing it being used more and more, particularly with the senior cycle students now. And like you're saying at, at third level, it, you know, we can't hide from it. It's, it's going to be here. We're going to have to embrace it. Like Google has become a, ter a verb. I'm sure ChatGPT or some other reference will become a, ter a verb in the next number of years. Um, so, yeah, I think if it's brought in in school level, that it's a tool, you know, and use it as a tool. I, I think it, it's it's great for the students there. And you just referenced something there about, I think, it was a Patrick's question about the topic and subject topics. We have used it here and tested it for sample lesson plans on topics. But the teacher has the expertise of the Irish curriculum syllabus. And it's dependent a little bit on the information you give it. So the more information you give it about, for example, maybe the learning outcome that you're looking for, the better the, the lesson plan it'll generate. And it does streamline it, uh, things like that for, for teachers. And I just briefly add, Stephen, that uh, an example there of design process. So immersive software engineering, uh, an additional entry requirement is a portfolio, which is worth 300 marks. But some students, what they submit, their focus is completely on the end result, the product. And what we're looking for is insights into the design process. What was the problem? Um, clearly state, a statement of the problem, an exploration of the solution space, how they evaluated candidates, how they identified the best one. And once they built out the product, then the evaluation. And that is something that I, at the moment, uh, ChatGPT cannot do in a cohesive framework. Totally agree with you, JJ. Um, Claire Gallagher asks, this technology looks exciting. My concern would be that it might encourage students not to do anything for themselves in terms of active learning. Um, I, I would agree with you, Claire. Uh, in our department in, in economics in UL, we, we've had a lot of discussion about this precise issue. How do we ensure that active learning happens um, both in the classroom and, and, and outside of it? Um, you know, it, it is something that we are gonna have to keep a much, much closer eye on because of course, it will look to all intents and purposes like lots of active learning has happened unless you, uh, as John said, uh, focus focus on the process. Norma asks, and maybe one for you, JJ, does it give different answers to the same question? I, if a class of students all type in the same essay question, does it give back the same or different essays? It gives different answers each time. Yeah. So that's what generate. makes it really difficult to detect from a plagiarism detection perspective. Um, no, no two answers are similar. Mm -hmm. and and that's a real challenge for us yeah yep. 
Very good. Brian says it might be a bit misleading to say chat believes everything on the internet. It's also capable of marshalling opposing arguments to show that opinion is divided on a subject. Fair point, Brian. Uh, I guess the point I was making about that is if if if, if uh, the entire corpus of the data that it takes in says two plus two equals five, then chat GPT will come out and say two plus two equals five. That's just because it, it doesn't understand what it's looking at, uh, uh, unfortunately, at least, at least not yet. Um, Claire asks, I would like to know who updates the information on this app. Very good question, Claire. And the answer is the OpenAI uh, group, which is a private company. Um, as I said, this is, a, this is um, the future is very much... Uh, uh, and can I add as well, Stephen, we're also helping them because they're collecting all the queries. Um, they're parsing them, filtering them behind the scenes, and mm -hmm. they're looking at the output as a means of quality control and quality assurance, etc. So in a way, we're working for free. Okay, <laughs> very good, JJ. A good question for you, JJ. Are you adjusting assessments yet? Oh, it's one for me too. Are you adjusting from Carl O'Brien? Adjusting assessments yet in light of ChatGPT? And if so, how are you doing so? I can say yes, uh, indeed that we are. Um, and, and the way uh, we are adjusting it is uh, we, we are asking the students to really go through their reasoning more and really get a sense of what they understand uh, more directly and also much more, uh, so if you like, eyeballing them. Uh, uh, before they 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 uh, they generate it, but maybe JJ, you can give a give a. a yeah, I, I really like that phrase eyeballing. So there are many more touch points. It's very expensive from a resourcing perspective to have uh, somebody like me inside the lab rather than what traditionally we might have is a more senior student. But that's necessary to be able to ensure that they're actually you know to be able to track their design process. Brilliant. Um, Patricia Daly asks uh, if it appears that ChatGPT, and this is one for you, Vivian, GPT returns very factual information um, for subjects like maths and coding and economics and so forth, but the written, written essay type questions have to be viewed cautiously. Would you agree, Vivian? Yeah, I mean, on the factual side of things, but even the factual side of it, it, it does need to be checked. And that's why we keep saying to the students, it, it can be used as a good reflection tool. We used it recently. I know one of my English teachers that they generated the essay um, it was based on a novel they'd read, and then they broke it down as a class and said, well, what do you think of that? What do you think of the viewpoint on it? You know, so using it as that type of a tool, going, oh, I think miss, that's totally us. You know, we're in the city here and the lads are gas-like. And it, it's got a really good conversation going about chat GPT, going, it doesn't know what it's talking about, miss. You know, and, but it's, yeah, it does. But anything that you do, I mean, I, I gave the example earlier, I think for your own, Stephen, I used it one Friday evening, I had an email to write out to teachers and I was wrecked. And all I could, I'm a math and science teacher anyway, and I'm a, I'm a bullet point person. But I said, I, I can't put this in the language to make it sound nice and encouraging going into the weekend. I put it into JetGPT and I asked it to give it, add some warm tones to it, give it a less formal sound. And I got a beautiful email back and it saved me about 45 minutes of procrastination. It got me home to my kids and got the teachers off thinking they had a lovely, a lovely principal that wrote a lovely email to them on a on Friday afternoon. And of course, now they know that it was completely written by AI. I'm out of now. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fantastic. Lorraine has a great uh, question. Consider the advantage of ChatGPT for more challenged learners with disabilities. So much of hurt further in higher ed is still assessed in written form. Um, any experience from the panel on this? Personally, no, uh, Lorraine. We, 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 it's week 12 here in UL, so we're just about to go into the assessment cycle. Um, uh, I am sure that thinking about ChatGPT as your own personal tutor is a, is a good way of thinking about things. And um, so it may help uh, 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 learners with, with particular disabilities, but I, I, I will ask JJ and, and Vivian for their experiences um, on this topic. JJ, maybe if you, you first. Oh, sorry, do you want to go JJ? Yeah, I, I, as you said, Steve, I, I think it's highly applicable to all, all learners irrespective of background, etc. And it's just a thought that occurred to me. Um, we all also need to support our, our high achievers, those people with very significant potential that are sitting in the classroom and how and these people are going to be, you know, the creatives of the next generation setting up the companies with these crazy ideas and how, how we can support them, them in a teaching and learning context as well. So I'd be looking at chat G, GPT. Um, but I, I definitely see lots of opportunities how we can deploy to support uh, learners with disabilities. I, I, discussions with our experts in-house here during the summer to make sure that I can figure out how to do that correctly. Vivian? Yeah, it's it, it probably something that, that that everyone should understand. So we designed the immersive software engineering program with the best and most active companies in the world in this topic. 
Um, we, ju you know, JJ wrote most of the, of the curriculum in, I believe it was 2021. We, we, we built most of the curriculum out and our first cohort are here. Uh, they're on campus now. They're about to go out to their residencies uh, in companies like Stripe and so forth now. And this summer, we're going to have to redo everything. Right. So, so just to, just to give people a sense of like, this was the, this, you know, the co co content of the course curriculum that we built for the most ambitious software engineering program in Europe is out of date, right? So we need to go faster and we will re redo that over the summer. Um, so Marcus Cosgrove asks, and actually it's, it's quite a good a question because it's with Owen. It's the same kind of thing as Owen Hayes's question. Should teachers allow students to use ChatGPT in the classroom? When do in CBAs and etc. That's Marcus's question, and uh, related to that, and Vivian, maybe one for you. Uh, Owen asks, should we be educating our students on how to use this resource in a classroom environment? In terms of the CBA part of it, yes, I would say. You know, again, you're framing it as a tool. We're not stopping them using Google to find information. So, you know, I don't think we'd stop them using ChatGPT. Ultimately, we're saying as teachers for CBA process, it is a classroom-based assessment, and it's their own work. You know, and that's what we need. We, we need to be saying to the students, look, use the chat GPT. Absolutely use it to inform you. I'll, I'll give you ideas. But you need to put this, you need to have an understanding of it. Going back to what I think was this, uh, John Heffernan was saying, assessing the process. Going back to you were saying, JJ, it's about the process to get there. Let chat GPT, in my opinion, in here in Tolmond, is let it be part of the process. You know, we can't hide from it. Banning it, sure, <laughs> that's never worked in any session, in anything over the years. So I think we could use it. Just going back to that question about building it in for students with disabilities. We, I was down the staff room today talking about it in light of this uh, panel this evening. And our learning support teachers have started using it just as a sample where they take an ebook, they might take the paragraph on a topic and ask, copy and paste in ChatPT and ask it to simplify the language. And they'll get the students to do that and break it down to a point the student can understand it and then sort of build it up and say, now that you've got a basic overview of that paragraph, go back and read it again. And they say it's working out very successfully from that because as you say, if they have an idea of what the paragraph is about in the very loose terms, it makes understanding the actual language of it a lot easier, puts a context and a, a scaffold on it. But I think it, it's, you know, another use, we have a staff meeting next week and we'll be talking about a lot of these things where teachers have been using it in the classroom. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think it should be used or can be used in the classroom. We haven't done any formal lessons with students on how to use it. It has come up in conversations and we've been open about it, but we haven't done any, any formal lessons on it. I think that, I mean, in fairness, I mean, like this thing is, you know, this, this is not even six months old, you know, for most, for most of us. And in, in this time next year, it'll be, it, you know, the tool itself will be vastly better. Chat GPT version 3.5 and chat GPT version 4, they're, 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 they're completely uh, different the, the the level that you can get to with the, the version four is incredible when version five comes out it'll be you know for, further along again oh i'd uh, imagine uh, Stephen, we haven't even imagined the capabilities of this in education in in yeah. even six months 12 months time what will be what what will be used for yeah exactly and we're thinking <laughs> about it, of course in terms of assessments instead of you know like I, I really do think in terms of like what and how we teach it's going to change everything uh, jj so you wanted to say something uh, yeah, just a thought. So ChatGPT4 includes the ability to um, upload diagrams and effectively query about, about it. And, and the subjects that I teach, there's a lot of diagrams, whiteboards, and then drawing concepts. And the diagram evolves or during the uh, duration of the lecture. And I think for a student who might be visually impaired or even for any student, et cetera, being able to you know, capture on their mobile, here's a picture uh, this person at the top of the room has drawn and try and walk me through what's going on to explain the concepts, how to, uh, what's the background, et cetera. I think that would be incredibly useful as well. And going back then to Stephen, um, no, up until recently, I, I felt my job was safe, um, but now all bets are off effectively. I think this is the impact, not only of ChatGPT, but there's a whole catalog of tools. And if you combine them into a framework, well, then you've got a clone of JJ Collins without the faults <laughs> and the unreliability of JJ Collins, et cetera. I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's where we're heading. I don't think, I don't think the AI will have the creativity of JJ Collins. Um, no. And fundamentally, you came up with a brand new, completely revolutionary program, JJ. ChatGPT can't do that. Right? Uh, well, I, I had a Stephen already there, right? 
helping in that as well. Yeah. But what it is about the human, you know, it's a tool that when it's used conjunction with the human experience, the human expertise, then yeah. it's fantastic. You know, I don't know if you heard, you could hear through the thing, but there's there's little um, parachutes being jumped off the balcony into our GP area now by the TYs. And of course, they could have chat, chat GPT how to design uh, uh, a parachute out of paper and, and twine that would float and how best would float. But the excitement they have out there screaming at each other who's gone down first, you know, that'll never be replaced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like this question. John Heffernan says, AI shows up shows up where students care about their learning. Just, to, you know, I think I'm just imagining fellas flinging stuff off. Ruse, uh, they they're really care about it. Mike Schumacher used to say that he would try and win at the slowest possible speed, small is beautiful. Um, uh, students want to complete assignments with the least amount of effort. If your assignment is just a hoop to jump, AI will give them a trampoline. Uh, John, that's a great phrase. I'm totally stealing it, by the way. Um, fair play to you. Um, 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 but I do think that we will begin this discussion about assessment because that's where the rubber meets the road in our in our in our worlds. Uh, but I think it's gonna alter how we teach fu fundamentally. And I, I absolutely agree with you. A couple of questions about, you know, is it worth paying for the versions? There's about four questions about asking, like, should we pay for this stuff? And um, all the payment does is it, it, you get the same service, but you, you're not you not rate limited. You can't, it puts you to the front of a queue. It will give you the same answer. Uh, and you can just ask an infinite numbers of questions. Can I just add Stephen there? They should be paying you. Oh yeah, 100%. You're the one you're as you ask it questions, you're training it to be smarter. You become part of the training data. Uh, Lorraine says she's writing a thesis on this. That's cool. Um, um, will interesting question. Will you use chat GPT to write your thesis about chat GPT? Right. Um, Anonymous asks, is there any danger? One for you, JJ, on a more sober note. Is there any danger that information given to chat GPT could be abused by the company who are running it? What data protection safeguards are there? Yeah, at the moment, the safeguards and protections are very, very limited. I, I think going forward to ensure compliance with GDPR in a European context, they'll have to provide silos effectively for data repositories. But at the moment, it's why West Country, you need to be aware of that, particularly to protect um, the identity of your students, etc. Very good. Um, Rachel asks, the Leaving Cert is currently being redesigned somewhat uh, towards a session in 50. And by the way, there's loads of questions coming in. So thank you very much for all of them. We're not going to get to them all in the time available. Um, uh, are the SEC and other bodies incorporating the impact of chat GPT into what the future senior cycle assessment will look like? I mean, I guess that's one for Danica and Paul and, and Vivian. Did you guys know, is it being incorporated by the SEC yet? That's uh, something that will be discussed and debated at a future date. I'm sure, Stephen, as uh, you know, it becomes more and more of a popular discussion topic. But um, one thing that I just want to, to flip to, because I'm conscious of time, is, you know, where do we go from here, like in terms of equipping our schools, our principals, our deputy principals, uh, our ETB staffs and so on? And I'm just going to ask each and every one of you maybe to give me just in, a, in, in one line, what would you do next if you were, had to go and prepare people for what we're talking about this afternoon. So for instance, in our context, we've been talking to our own principals and deputy principals about ChatGPT and, and to think about that, how it's gonna play out in terms of you know, the practical issues and challenges that may arise. I'm um, just thinking of, for example, you know, an, an English teacher or an Irish teacher who gets really upset that they find out that a student has you know, generated a, a response, which is A1 or H1 uh, standard, and then that creates a disciplinary matter, uh, you know, so our, our, our codes of behavior up to date, date for instance, yeah. how are we going to manage all that? So I might go to Vivian on that and then go to Stephen and JJ for what you're going to do next or what you would do next. And then we'll go to Paul. Uh, I suppose what we're doing is on the 27th this month, we're having a staff meeting. We're just going to have a conversation about it. You know, where students have we had experience of it in the classrooms? If we have, where has it been? In terms of code of behaviour, at the moment, I wouldn't see myself even looking at writing that in. You know, I, I think if we bring that type of discipline action into it, we're making it a bad thing. I think if we embrace it as a as a tool, a learning tool, I love John's expression there about the trampoline and the, the hoop. You know, if we use it as, as that's the lens that we're looking at it for the moment, as you said, things are going to change so quickly. It'll, it'll, it'll evolve very quickly in the next few months, What we we'll, how we'll handle it. Um, but definitely talking to the staff at the moment and just... I suppose exploring how we're using it, how we can use it in a positive way. 
Um, I, I think I'm next. Um, so I think the first thing that I would do is uh, we're going to send a link out of the slides that JJ and I, I wrote. There's a bunch of resources in there. So have a look at those, uh, particularly about the plagiarism detection softwares and things like that, but also about just the basics of, of what you do. And, and like Vivian um, in the Department of Economics, we've had a number of meetings uh, in UL just about how we as, a, as as educators would 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 um cope with this um economics is obviously very different to the immersive software engineering group um where you know they're they're being given they're they're building the tools to manipulate this right we're uh, in the economics it's quite different we, we are very much the same as the irish and english teacher in in in, in a certain sense vivian right and um, and so we're we're embracing it and and i think like i said before thinking carefully about the assessment structure and how it is we describe what learning means to us, like what we want to see when we talk about learning um, and uh, how we, I mean, I, I can come back to this eyeballing it. You can know when someone understands something when you stare at them. If they get it, you you see that they get it. And I think that's um, that's very much, uh, it's very much our thinking so far, but I think the, the key for me is humility in front of this thing because it's it's the, nobody's the expert in this even even the even the people who've studied ai for 20 years are not the experts in this um and so coming to it from a place of humility and saying we're just going to have a go at this we're going to get it wrong we're going to we're going to improve uh, is i believe the right way to to um to do things but yeah i'll stop there next so um just briefly i, I will get the students to write a code of conduct based on the benefits and liabilities of chat GPT, uh, and then for faculty staff to be able to critique those essays, et cetera. So I, I think all around collectively, we all need to educate ourselves in how to effectively use this tool. And there are lots of benefits, but some liabilities as well. Well, it's just fascinating. Uh, that hour was one of the fastest hours I've ever seen going uh, on a webinar. And I just want to thank uh, expressly Stephen, JJ, Vivian and Paul for everything and I'm going to hand you over to Paul now who will uh, just uh, close out with some final closing remarks so thanks Paul. Uh, thanks very much uh, to all our panellists and I'll name them all in a moment just to say I suppose looking at it in a very practical sense I think it's important that I suppose I'm looking at this from a whole staff perspective where there would be a conversation at staff level and I think that's really in relation to you know do we do we when we inquire about this do we put do we protect what we have or do we embrace do we embrace it i clearly heard the language there today in relation to look at this from an embracing perspective rather than try and lock it down or lock it out uh, certainly there's a, a rethink re required or i suppose a debate required in relation to how we assess in post-primary schools or even in primary schools and also in relation to our classroom teaching so i suppose that's if i was putting something together for a staff i think i'd put on the agenda the assessment piece but also the classroom teaching and how it changes there was a great question asked there in relation to, I suppose, students themselves. And one of the things that strikes me about all of this is the ability to personalize the learning, but also to adapt the learning to suit the needs of the student. So I think they're the kind of summary themes that I picked up on in, in, in relation to today. If I looked at it through three telescopes, I'd see certainly there's an impact for students, uh, there's an impact for teachers, and there's an impact for leaders in relation to how they go about their work, but also how, how they lead out on this. But look, at that's a lovely uh, uh, conversation and debate. It has certainly uh, opened up my eyes and ears in relation to the potential for this and where we're going. I, I noticed at the beginning, Stephen talked about uh, the 14 and 15 year olds, how it'll impact on them. And then he talked about his generation. And then there's my generation, Stephen. So I, there's, there's three of us in some degree. Look, overall, I'd like on behalf of ETBI, I'd like to thank UL for their engagement and their support and insights in relation to today's concept. We'll be with you again in summer for our summer school in, in June. So we're engaging with UL quite a bit at the moment. Can I thank JJ for his insights and knowledge and answers on the spot. Stephen for his uh, his broad uh, uh, understanding and trying and reading of the questions with enthusiasm, but also offering this, uh, the answers on the spot. He, to some degree, he has his own version of ChatGP that he can answer the questions. And Vivian for her lovely practical approach in relation to how this has been done in schools. Can I thank, and finally, Behind the scenes, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, Donica and his committee in relation to, in, IT, in ETBI, the ICT committee, Donica's leadership on this in relation to saying, this is an area we must bring, up, bring our schools to have a conversation on. And he has opened up the, uh, the conversation for us in that sense. So I appreciate uh, that this is new, 
and he's on the cusp of the edge in relation to developing it for us. So we greatly appreciate it. I know there's lots of counties are going to put into chat GPT immediately afterwards how to take uh, a hurling uh, trophy off uh, Limerick and we'll see if it works. So overall, I, I appreciate uh, the insights from everyone and also to everyone for taking the time, all of our participants today. We were up at 265 in today, uh, participants. So for taking the time out to give this, an area, give this an area for consideration. We appreciate all the time put into that. So, Donica, over and out, and thanks to you. Thanks, to you, thanks very much to yourself. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a lovely evening. Thanks, all. Thanks, all. Bye bye now. Thank you, everybody. One of the proudest days of my life to be here today because um, around 34 years ago I was a student uh, in an ETB in Clóisí Dúlig in Coolock studying journalism and uh, I never thought I'd uh, end up presenting uh, the awards ceremony here today. It was a little bit uh, more low-key in those days. We were handed certificates in the hall, I think, at the end of our studies. Um, but it set me on a journey for lifelong education and a career that's brought me all around the world. I've had a fantastic time and it all began all those years ago in Kalosh Tadulig ETB in Kulak, not far from where I grew up in Rohini and it gave me a pathway uh, to a fabulous career, it gave me a, a pathway to explore things I wanted to explore as a, as a kid, to cover big events, to cover international events as a journalist and I found my path in Kalosh Tadulig. I am so excited to be here at the ETB Excellence Awards, um, firstly to obviously given an award and also to be performing it's incredible that myself as well coming from an etv school and also being recognized to be on such a platform and um, it feels like a full circle so this moment is actually a huge achievement for myself and to even see the people following in my footsteps or that will be coming after so i'm really grateful to be here today and to have some form of recognition thank you so much Delighted to be here today for my ETB day in Crow Park. What a fabulous occasion. Probably 350 people here from all our 16 ETBs. Um, really good music, really good awards, and uh, looking forward to the rest of the day. What a great occasion it is to promote our ETB all over Ireland. So delighted as president to be here today and to say a few words and wish everybody well for the rest of the week. I'm delighted to be here today at the ETB Awards. Um, my ETB, I suppose, is all about inclusion and equality, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today. We're delighted to be here for um, ETB Day and delighted to have so many nominees and we're looking forward to the event and it's a super day out in Crow Park. Uh, we're very excited to be here for the awards. Tommy Dan Shaw, Kunke Laura, and Sorry Dukas in ETB I, a Park and Crow Kiganu, and Tasha Okad, all in our fad, Seth here doing on shot, Anna Kudini, a Chakta Kela, or Eat O Skulane ETB, more Hinkle learned here. August in our era is is desh untuk a kunke lora na skalari agus kamalishin na moon tori na previsi gakalian dinna a kornesh on ETB um, in Erin. Really excited to be here in Crow Park today with City of Dublin ETB, and I think what encapsulates for us is the issue of equality. for Community Award and we're feeling absolutely delighted and we can't wait to bring this award back to the group and show them the great work that they're doing and that they deserve this award. The award for um, respect for restorative practitioners in all of the KCETB communities 
um, and it was great delight that I accept this award on their behalf. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to promote restorative practice and the empowering positive um, influence that this has, not just in our schools but on our communities. I've just won the Excellence in Care Award with the ETBI and I'm absolutely thrilled and overwhelmed. So I won the Excellence in Equality Award. I'm absolutely delighted to have received this on behalf of all of our amazing staff in the City of Dublin. ATB who work really, really hard always to promote equality, diversity, representation, inclusion and visibility. Absolutely delighted to have won the winner of the National Staff Competition. Um, for me, it's an absolute privilege and honour to work for the ATBs. We do such fabulous work and uh, it's great to be able to recognise the good work that we do and the impact it has on so many lives. Uh, Ina and Downer, Margus Tom Air of Winnemucca. This morning, on the Don Pancho, Argus Tom Sarvri Cosmo Ventura Pod, Siskol, Argus Air Gotten a Hog Pocky of Dum, Carnavinta. Won the Excellent in Youth Services Award, which we weren't really expecting to win. We were delighted just to come on the day, so it was a big buzz. My heart is beating. I kind of know what it's like at the Oscars. We're after winning the award, the Excellence Award for Green Procurement, and this is the Galway Ross Common. Head office and Claren College in Athen Rye. So, absolutely delighted. Students will be delighted. Well, well, yeah, it's great. We're so, so delighted. We're, we're, we're overwhelmed. Picked up the Excellence in Education Award and we're delighted and really proud and honoured to accept this on behalf of our colleagues as well. My name is Siobhan Murray and I'm the Recognition of Prior Learning Coordinator with Donegal ETB and we won the award for Excellence in Further Education and Training. Hi, guys. So I'm the Trinity UC winner of the Creative Multimedia Competition Award and when I won the award I was just completely and utterly shocked, like honestly I couldn't believe it but I'm so happy I had the experience to do this so thank you very much. Fabulous. Community. Inclusion. Fantastic. It's inclusive. And helpful. Great sense of community here today. Le Gokhtanai Chok Takela. Kinta Gwela Kunu. Supported. Accepting. Inclusive. I just want you to know. I want you to know you'll be okay. You'll be alright. I just want you to know. I want you to know. You'll be just